And uh, if you just look on the internet on a daily basis, you'll see that the economic collapse is just imminent. It's somehow being uh, kept alive. The question is, and this is what I need to end on, because we can't keep talking about doom and gloom all the time. We need to talk about what are we going to do as a species? What are we going to do when it all collapses? And this is where the most exciting thing happens. And this is my message to everyone in the world. This is where the true humanity shines, and we realize how beautifully we can survive without money. We have to find a new system because this system is broken. It doesn't work. Um, we cannot continue doing what we've been doing for the past 6,000 years. That is insanity. And as you know, insanity is defined as doing something over and over again and expecting different results. So hopefully after 6,000 years, we now have learned. Don't try and fix the current system. Change it completely. What is the one thing that we can do to change it? You know what that is. And this is where the Ubuntu Liberation Movement comes in. <laughs> Join the movement. Realize it's a movement about higher consciousness. It's about... It's about breaking all the norms that we've been conditioned to believe, standing up to authority, and taking back what belongs to us, living, breathing human beings. The Ubuntu Contribution System, I called it Contributionism in 2005 when I first started writing about it, completely new social structure, abundance for all. It's based on ancient knowledge when they didn't have money, where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greatest benefit of all in the community. It's a simple system. It comes with a lot of questions because we're so poisoned by capitalism, con consumerism. It raises many questions instantly, but I've been through this thousands and thousands of times. I can already think what, tell you what you're thinking, and I'm going to tell you what you're thinking just now. It goes back to the African roots called Ubuntu. All ancient cultures, in a way, shared this African system called Ubuntu. They have different names for it, but it always comes down to the same thing. It's amazing that the ancient cultures survived for thousands of years not using money, and they thrived, as Foster Gamble would say. And they had a similar philosophy. If it's not good for everyone, it's no good at all. And that is a beautiful philosophy that I'd like to share with everybody because I don't want to do anybody harm, and I don't want to do anything that's going to harm anyone because it does me good. I'm not interested in doing that. And this is why the whole Ubuntu contributionism system, the Ubuntu movement, is a movement of higher consciousness. It is for people moving into a new age, a new era of higher consciousness. Exactly that. So that's the virus we want to inject into the South African parliament. Higher consciousness. Not because I want to run for president. In fact, if by some miracle I became president, and this was a question that was asked me in Durban last weekend at our first public meeting, so what's going to do? If, what are you going to do if you become president? I said, well, the first thing I'll do is I'll dissolve the government. Just dissolve the whole government. Just, just, just dismantle it. And give the power to the people, wherever they are, to start their own local communities. Rewrite the laws. The laws we have are not written for the people. They're written for the corporations. Our inalienable, inalienable rights. This is what I need to remind people of. And this is... <clears throat> Beautiful, because this is part of the ANC's Freedom Charter that they stood for for over 100 years. Now, it's been very conveniently forgotten. And this has become the, the new Freedom Charter for the Ubuntu movement. The country belongs to the people. The land belongs to its people. The water, the minerals, the air, the air waves doesn't belong to Vodafone. It belongs to the people. The forests and everything in the country belongs to the people. <laughs> yeah, the, the land in China belongs to the people and they should do exactly the same this applies to every country people it does not belong to the government or any large corporation that has laid claim to it and when you read this statement you realize that we've appointed our leaders to be our servants but they're not serving us we appointed them to do the best for us not for them so whatever we want and we need as a people they should be doing for us is that happening? no, the opposite is happening so what has happened here? The government is not serving the people. The only conclusion we can reach is that they're serving themselves and the corporation that fund them. They've turned the people into their slaves. The government and large corporations have stolen the country from its people. It's as simple as that. We've become the slaves, and unless we do something about it, it stops. How do we know this? In South Africa, I don't know about... These countries, I believe uh, the European countries, how it works now, I haven't done that research because I'm focusing there. The government of South Africa 
and the Republic of South Africa are both registered as two separate corporations on the U.S. Securities Exchange. So they're corporations that trade us as commodities. Every week, new laws are passed in every country, I guess, in South Africa. It's published in the Government Gazette. Nobody knows where to get it, how to read it, what it means, but they publish in the Government Gazette and they get away with it. You see, it was published. You didn't object, so now it's a new law. That's how they get away with it. But every week, they publish new laws that we don't understand and we don't want. Our laws protect the corporations. They do not serve the people. Corporations have more rights than living, breathing human beings. I've witnessed this in my own presence in court on three occasions, and the fund gets better every day. Because, you know, um, for those of you that have been following some of what I've been doing, uh, two weeks ago, our legal advisor, Raymond Dix, was attacked in his house by ten armed men, uh, tied up and held at gunpoint for three and a half hours while they ransacked his office, his home office. They made it look like a, a robbery, but uh, when they left and very carefully removed his computer, his hard drive, his backup hard drive, and his secondary hidden backup hard drive, which they knew exactly where it was, they left with only two other things. The legal files pertaining to my actions against the courts, the, the banks, and Scott Kundal's files, the New Economics Rights Alliance, the Ubuntu movement, my movement, and New Economics Rights Alliance. Those are the only files, legal files that disappeared. So it's very clear what's going on here. The banks hit us where it hurts most, that our nerve center removed all our research, documentation, and files, but we had backups elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so now it's obvious, you know, if they take me out, they just created another martyr. So bring it on. <laughs> I, I don't care. I know where I'm going. I'm going to sit on the right-hand side of Jesus. <laughs> We need a whole new legal system written for the people, by the people, not by the corporations and the governments that want to schnei the people into the ground. Everything in South Africa and in other countries belongs to the people. ESCOM, for example, is the electricity supply giant that supplies most of Africa with electricity. All the installations of ESCOM belong to the people. The coal they use that they get out of the ground to charge us for the electricity belongs to the people because the coal belongs to the people. Sasol is the, the coal to, to liquid uh, petroleum company. That was paid for by the taxpayer. The technology was developed from German technology in the 1920s. That was paid for by the South African taxpayer, all the early installations for Sasol. So all the fuel that we should be driving on in South Africa, we should have virtually for free because all the components belong to the people. The railways run every day, but they don't transport people. They transport coal and wood. Everything for the corporations, nothing for the people. You can't catch a train anywhere in South Africa. And so it goes. The forestry, the minerals. Forestry between Sapi and Mondi in South Africa, they own more than a million hectares of land that they somehow managed to take possession of. Who gave it to them? The people didn't agree to give it to them, but it belongs to them. So you can see how this theft of the land and the, the, all the inalienable rights of the people of the land have been stolen and given to corporations. So the government and the large corporations have stolen the country from its people. It's obvious. What do the people need? This is where we start seeing the beautiful side and how simple things can be. What do we need? We need food, water, love, friendship, homes, tables, chairs, knives, forks, gardens, clothes, technology, health care, arts and culture. We need everything that each and every one of you can imagine and beyond. We need everything and we should have all of it because there should be no hurdles to achieving this and having that, right? We do not need money. Did you see money anywhere in that list? No, we don't need money. Money gets in the way. Money is the obstacle. It's the hurdle to all progress. Money does nothing. People do everything. People plow the lands, grow the food, build the bridges, build the rockets, solve the mathematical equations, create the technology. People do everything. Money does nothing. Money is just the obstacle to all this incredible progress. People create the arts and the culture. Money does nothing. The origins of money goes back to Sumeria once again. These Sumerians, the first forms of money were really little clay tablets. They were tokens of exchange. And then eventually they started minting them, as you know. 
So for millennia, great minds have stood up against the abuse of humanity through money. It's not something new. Julius Caesar stood up against the money, the, 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 the powers of money. It took back from the money changes the power to coin money and minted coins on benefit of all. With his new plentiful supply of money, he established many massive construction projects and built great public works. And we all know what happened to Julius Caesar. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas in 1225 said that the charging of interest is wrong because it applies to double charging, charging for both the money and the use of money. In fact, church law in the Middle Ages forbade the charging of interest on loans and even made it a crime called usury, which we know very well today. And even Jesus in his last year of life, probably the only physical force he ever applied, was throughout the money changes out of the temple because they were abusing the people. And this is by far the most cutting statement made in recent times, Thomas Jefferson, because this is what we find ourselves in today. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties and standing armies. If the American people ever allow private banks, remember all our banks in the world, are virtu virtually all the banks are private banks, private corporations, whose interest is making profit at all cost. So if the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their currency, first by inflation, then by deflation, the banks and the corporations that will grow up around the, the banks will drive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. That's where we are standing today. All over the world, this is the situation we're in. Money is the obstacle to all progress. It does nothing for society. It is the absolute tool of control by those that control the issue and the printing of money. That's why when I say they own the world, they do. They literally, physically own the world and each of one of our asses. It prevents the natural flow of free energy. And that is very important to this weekend's activities here. Money prevents the natural flow of free energy. So I beg you, everyone present here, Remember, it's about free energy, not I'm going to make a billion dollars out of this energy. Give it away for free. It'll come back to you in ways you cannot imagine. Do that one thing for humanity. If you find any source of free energy, don't try and make zillions out of it. It will kill you or they will kill you before you can get it out there. Money is the primary cause for the seven deadly sins. We all know the seven deadly sins, or have we forgotten them already? It's not the love of money. Many people ask, oh, it's just the love of money. Money is nothing wrong with money, man. It's just a form of exchange. You know, we're so poisoned that we, we, try, and, we try and argue for, for it. We try and defend it. That's how poisoned our minds have become. It's incredible. It's not the love of money. It's the mere presence of money that causes all these problems. If you take money out of the system, all this stuff suddenly and miraculously vanishes. So what is the solution? If it's the mere presence of money or the love of money of all of the above, what are we going to do to solve the problem? The answer is so blatantly obvious. Remove money. Just get rid of it. Get rid of it. What do we need it for? It's causing all the strife in our lives. It's destroying our planet. The minds are raping our mother earth, taking out the precious guts out of our Gaia and distributing it around the world to People that claim they own it, it's sick. The obvious questions, if you remove money, so who's going to shovel the crap? How are we going to pay for things? I'll just sit on my ass and do nothing. I want 50 Ferraris. You know, Are we going back to the dark ages, living in caves? Is this a lawless society? Who's going to make the rules? Why should I do something I don't want? These are the first things. I know that these are the most commonly asked questions, and I'm sure that you're asking some of them to yourselves. But um, I can tell you that as you work through this process of a moneyless society, a Ubuntu society where everybody contributes their natural talents or acquired skills to the greatest benefit of all with certain minor rules that are not rules. It's really just an agreement that this is how we're going to work together. The moment you start working in that kind of community, the abundance is so spectacular that we right now cannot imagine it. It is not possible for us to imagine it until you start immersing yourself in this kind of thinking. And I call these the Ubuntu communities, as I said, where everyone contributes their natural talents or acquired skills for the greater benefit of all in the community. A new social structure for a new 
world and a new age. Abundance for all beyond our wildest belief. There are five mantras, five key points to the Ubuntu.